We are the Professional Ski Instructors of America and the American Association of Snowboard Instructors. Our job is to get you fired up about skiing and snowboarding. It is not just a profession, it is a way of life. These are our stories. <laughs> first wanted to become a ski instructor, I had this idea that that the way that they chose who got to teach, especially in Aspen, you know, it has this sort of idea that it's Aspen, you know. Um, the idea that I got for how they select their ski instructors was from the movie Aspen Extreme. <laughs> so I had this idea in my head that it was super hot feet and you had to be able to jump through the bumps and that that's what it was all about. And we have, in the training department, incredible skiers, and they hold us to a very high standard. They expect us to be constantly evolving our movement patterns and our understanding of how we move and how we teach. But the piece that's really different is that what they really want here, the culture they're really nurturing here, are people that educate. One of the luxuries of working in a ski school uh, like we have here in Aspen Snowmass is we have a lot of instructors that have been around for a long time. We have instructors that have been around over 40 years teaching skiing. They have a ton of experience and they're really eager to share it. And one of the reasons they've been so successful and that we're able to draw people into the industry and maintain them in the industry is that they have an avenue to bounce feedback off each other. So we are able to learn from our trainers, from our students, um, but as well as from each other. So the trainers will get together and debrief, but it's not just the trainers. The pros will sit down in the locker room and uh, the locker room talk is, is quite progressive and people working on things and kind of hashing out their days asking for advice on uh, how they can um, improve on their lesson tomorrow based on the experience they had today. They do that by learning from the person in the locker next to them. One of the things that's really interesting about the way we approach teaching is to create a culture of trust. What it really does is it shows that people are able to check their egos at the door. We have a lot of 8 o'clock morning trainings across the four resorts. There's usually something scheduled for every morning of the week. And when you step back and watch the process, there can be anywhere between 10 and 40 pros that are willing and ready to go as they get out on the hill in the morning. They're in uniforms because that's what help us get up the chair in the morning. So it's a very um, fun process to watch. It's colorful, it's professional, and these folks are out here getting out a, an hour before they need to show up for work just to help their own process and, and be able to give back more to the guests. One of the coolest things about Aspen Snowmass is that the leadership by example. You know, today Kitty Erdl was out there, our managing director, and she was getting feedback on our skiing. And that's not just typical of today, that happens almost all the time. Katie will ask, hey, if you see anything in my skiing, let me know. I was trying to focus on my transition okay. and the idea of, as I shorten the new inside leg, lengthening the new outside leg, okay. but I tend to do it a little bit quickly. So I'm okay. working on being more progressive, but it's not coming easy for me. Okay. I like the focus in the legs. Um, I'd like to see you use your upper body to try to complement that. Okay. That's the piece I think that's not moving enough. Oh. Right? Forward or? Yeah. So when you're in that transition, you know, you're flexing this leg and lengthening okay. this one, but the upper body is just kind of staying right there. Okay. So make sure that it's moving out Across. to that outside leg okay. through the whole turn okay because then you'll be halfway there already all right so it'll make that transition a little okay. feel a little you'll, like you'll have more time okay because you were moving to the outside ski from up here from up here okay through the higher in the turn i can pay attention to that okay. i was just at a talk with klaus obermeyer who uh, is a big icon in this area as well as the whole world and the ski world and uh, he said in his uh, bavarian accent um, you know, I, I think that uh, the Obermeyer, we should have a potato sack at the door and we should have everybody put their egos in the sack because the ego gets in the way of people being able to see each other's perspectives. It's not only just give and take, but it's an example that you set, you know, not, not just do what I say, but watch what I do. And uh, when pe people are, are, are comfortable getting feedback and then giving feedback, it's, 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 it opens up an entire door of trust and possibilities uh, that uh, I haven't seen in a lot of other organizations. Yeah, so you're taking advantage of the whole ski, it's okay. gonna hold better. Okay. Okay, there was a couple times where 
because you're up front, you yeah. lose the outside ski a little bit because you're so far forward, that tail would break away on you. Okay. Go ahead and stand on the tail late in the turn. Use the My thing. background is in mental performance coaching. So one of the things that I'm trying to bring to our educational process is the idea of um, how do you handle yourself under pressure so that you can move the way that you want to move. And that it relates to our guests in that we deal a lot with fear. So sometimes people think that in order to become a better skier, they just have to be better or more willing to be afraid, right? To ski scarier parts of the mountain. And the way that we kind of come at it is that that's not necessarily true through tactics and technical teaching and some mental performance coaching, you can face that fear, learn a technique that'll get you through it so that that kind of terrain feels like easy blue terrain to you now. And it's, it's really a holistic approach to skiing in the training department and for our clients and guests. <laughs> so this, Teddy, this represents everything that Andrew knows and understands about skiing that makes him feel happy and safe. Okay, this is his idea. And maybe this teddy represents a movement pattern that you know is not going to be super effective in the train that you want to take him into. So maybe this teddy represents Andrew's desire to kind of ski like this a little bit, right? So we all have guests that ski like this. It's sort of an older movement pattern, but it's functional. It's like your security blanket. I want to keep this close to me, okay? What if I have something for you? Ready? I want you to take this, take it. I want you to, I have all of this information. Look at this thing, right? This is everything I know. Right? And that this continuous experimentation benefits the guest in the end because the pros aren't afraid to try new things. And if it doesn't work with the guest, well, we move on and we'll try something else. But if it does work, then we kind of put it in our little bank of experiments that have been successful. And then we move on to the next one and try it again. So there's a whole bunch of experimentation and also creativity that comes from that. So uh, your seat good? Get the mirrors all adjusted so you can see everything okay? Just stay off the freeways, all right? I don't want you going out on those yet. Just leave your phone in your purse. I don't want you texting. Daddy, right? okay. Okay. There you go. Be careful. Thanks, Dad. Call me, but not while you're driving. Mm -hmm. We knew this day was coming. That's why we bought a Subaru. Admit it, you've always secretly dreamed of becoming a ski or snowboard instructor. So what are you waiting for? The Professional Ski Instructors of America and American Association of Snowboard Instructors make it possible to turn your passion into a profession by becoming a certified pro. No other professional organization gives you access to the tools, resources, and credentials to make your dream of becoming an instructor a reality. For more information, visit www.thesnowpros.org. Hey guys, I was thinking about carving our skis and skidding our skis for skiing all over the mountain and how um, oftentimes our students are a little confused about which is which and when to do which on the mountain. Yeah. I think those are really good questions to ask and to know when the ski can slide or slip a little more and when we can really put it up on the edge and carve a little bit more and how that can help make the mountain experience so much more fun. So hey, here's an idea. Why don't we try turn this into a little ski lab. Katie, you and I, let's go focus on skidding. We'll hypothesize a little bit about it. And Kate and Andy, why don't you guys go work on some carving and we'll figure out what the results are. Excellent. That sounds good. Sounds good. So Andy, when you teach a lesson that's carving based, how do you introduce the student to the concept of the edge of the ski or how the ski works in the snow? Yeah, good question. 
I usually try to make, make sure I spend some time describing the anatomy of a ski. Okay. And skis have evolved over the years. Now we have more of a carving ski or a shape ski they're referred to. I like to point out how the tail is wider, mm -hmm. the waist is narrower, and the tip is wider. Now, with the wider, narrower, wider, when we tip it on edge, it will actually help bend the ski, and that gives us some ski performance that we'll talk about in a minute. So Kate, what I do to demonstrate this is I will actually take off a ski, set it on the snow, and I will point out that the tail is wider and the tip is wider, and the waist is narrow and doesn't touch until we put pressure by standing on it in the middle. As the ski moves forward, the tail will follow the tip, and it creates an arc in the snow and leaves a really thin line. This shows the design of the ski, and then we talk about how this will help them when we're on the snow. That's great, Andy. I think being able to see the arc that the ski leaves in the snow is really helpful. Let's click in and see what body parts we have to move in order to tip the ski up onto its edge. Sounds great. So in order to tip the skis up onto their edge so they can leave those clean sliced arcs in the snow, I'm gonna roll my feet and my ankles in one direction or uphill. So this might be a one of a tip or edge angle. This might be two. And then this might be three. You can see I'm rolling my feet further. And then to untip them, I might go down two, one. So you have one, two, three, two, one. And that's the same movement we're gonna make when we're skiing. That's great, Kate, thanks. Now that we've seen what the ski does on the snow and how it carves, and you've shown us what we need to do with our body to make the ski tip over on its edge, let's take it into some traverses across the hill and actually feel it. That sounds great. So now that we've clicked into our skis, we're gonna take the skills of counting one, two, three, and put it into motion when we're going across the hill. After you've found a nice, safe place to do your traverses, set up with your skis facing across the hill on a level one edge angle. As you start moving, you can progress into a level two or maybe a level three edge angle, looking behind you and seeing the nice, clean, thin line in the snow. Now that we've had success in leaving a thin, clean line in the snow behind us in a shallow traverse, we want to try to do it a little bit more down the hill, picking up more speed and then bringing it across the hill, still leaving the same thin line in the snow. That's really helpful to begin to get the feeling of the ski carving and seeing those two thin lines. Let's go out and start to link some turns and get a progressive tipping and untipping of the ski. I love it, let's do it. Let's go skiing. So a great place to practice this is on a green or an easy blue groomed run. Yeah, we'll take the same exercises that we've been doing with one, two, three on our edge angles and try that in both directions, leaving that same thin clean line in the snow behind us. Hey Katie, so with skidding, the way that I think about it is it's a combination between going forwards and going sideways with the ski on the snow. Yeah, I would agree with that. And the cool thing is how many different applications you can use that in in all mountain skiing when a student knows how to do that with their ski. I've got a great way to look at it on snow without being in your skis just to demonstrate the path of the tail and the tip. Do you want to see that? Oh yeah, let's do it. So Kevin, when I'm showing a student about a skidded turn, I'll put the ski flat on the snow, and as I move it through the turn, I show that the tail takes a bit of a bigger path than the tip. Do you have any ideas for how to do that on snow? I sure do, yeah. Thanks for showing me that, Katie. What I like to do is take the students down and do something that I call a falling leaf drill that really gets after that combination of forward and sideways motion. Great, let's give it a whirl. All right. Notice in this falling leaf exercise how the skis move both forward and sideways at the same time. This is a great exercise to practice and really feel that sensation of the skis skidding that will help you take it into a skidded parallel turn. Hey Katie, really good job on the falling leaf drill. The next step I would take is click out of our skis and do a feet and leg turning exercise on the snow. Cool, can I see it? Sure. It's a little something like this. Oh, so that's cool. So what you can see with Kevin doing here, he's turning both thighs at the same time. 
and the toes and heels are turning at the same time and that really ties in nicely to a parallel skidded turn which we'll be doing next. Watch here as we do basic parallel turns. Both legs are turning at the same time. The tail is taking a wider path than the tip. While the teams were working on carving and skidding on their alpine skis, I was doing the same experimentation on my telemark skis. The only difference is my trailing foot, I have my heel up in the air. So I'm doing all that movement on the ball of my foot. It's essentially the same. On the carving, I want my tail to follow the tip. And while I'm skidding, I want the tail to take a wider path than the tip. So virtually the same. So I was experimenting, doing the same falling leaf, but on my telemark skis, and I've pretty much came up with the same results. And that is, is that I've got a low edge angle and I can steer my skis quite easily. The extra additional part of the falling leaf going backwards really enhances your telemarking. So while I was working on carving on my telemark skis, I was really trying to be progressive with my edge. So I would go from a low edge angle, a one, and progressively and slowly go up to a two and a three, and then slowly bring it back down, three, two, one, not having an abrupt movement to the edge. And it gave me a nice smooth carve. All right, so how did it go, you guys? You know, it went really well. Katie and I, we did skidding, and we learned that you have to have a flatter ski, you're going to turn both feet and legs at the same time, and that the tails are going to take a wider path than the tips. Yeah. Cool. And we had a great time out practicing carving, and what Andy and I noticed is that you need an edgier ski, both feet are going to tip at the same time, and you're going to leave a thin arc in the snow. And what I noticed about what's cool about skidding is you can really control your speed through the arc of the turn if you want to get into some more difficult terrain. That was fun to play with. Well, we kind of found the opposite, that when we were carving, we were feeling a lot more comfortable maintaining that speed. Really dynamic turns that were a lot of fun to make. That's really cool. You know, I found when uh, you guys were off on, on your own, I was on my telemark skis, and even with the extra movement, with every turn, each foot going fore and aft, it's virtually the same. So we need a blend of carving and skidding to go out and enjoy the entire mountain. New England Disabled Sports. Basically, it is uh, rules my life, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It's, uh, it's my passion, it's what I love to do. Um, but what's cool for me is that it's not just skiing. It, for me, it's sports in all different times of the year. Um, so I get to, through my organization and, and working here, I get to experience a lot of really cool things, a lot of amazing sports, touch a lot of really um, amazing people. When a client comes here for the first time, what they get is an experience that's gonna change their life forever. It's gonna be eye-opening to them what they're gonna be able to do. Because a lot of times you come here thinking, I'm gonna try this, and you end up trying 10 other sports throughout your career maybe with us. You know, it opens your eyes to a lot of different things, not just that you're gonna maybe be able to ride down a hill. And I think even when you get here and you realize that you can, that you can ski with whatever disability you have, that you're gonna be able to now go kayaking or you're gonna be able to get out to the beach or you're gonna be able to go fishing in one of our fishing programs or a variety of things. So it's, it's eye-opening from that level, but it's also eye-opening to the, the fact that you're gonna meet people who are out in life doing things or 
that networking that happens when you come here too, meeting other family members of somebody that's disabled so that they kind of come together and are able to um, find better ways to take on, on the world. My personal story is kind of why I'm so passionate about what I do and what I get to do. It's because um, I was a skier prior to, um, you know, becoming to an adaptive ski school. And I came here to, at the time it was called the White Mountain Adaptive Ski School, um, now New England Disabled Sports, and that was in 1995. I had a, uh, a snowmobile injury that happened up on the Kankamangas Highway, which is right here in the White Mountains. Um, flipped off a snowmobile and caught my chest in a guardrail post, broke my back at T7, T8, which is thoracic vertebrae seven and eight. Um, so I'm a complete spinal cord injury. So I have no use of my legs and I don't have any um, abdomen muscles either from that injury. Um, you know, it was a hard time in the, in the very beginning. You know, you're, you're a lot of what ifs going through your mind in that those first few moments. But I just had this overwhelming feeling that came over me and I don't know where it came from. You know, divine intervention, whatever you may say, but it was just, hey, you, things are going to be okay. And I kind of took that that knowledge or that feeling um, into my rehab. Um, I also early on found out my all my friends were, hey, you're going to be able to ski again at the mountain. That I, I didn't really know much about the adaptive program, like a lot of people. They don't know that it exists or, or that it's around, which I've done a lot to try to change that since then. But um, that. I knew that I was going to be able to ski again and that was a, a great thing to kind of be able to take into the rehab hospital. I treated it like a sports injury and I knew I needed to get back into sports somehow because that was so much of my life before. I was, you know, playing college soccer at a, at a high level. I was, you know, running soccer camps. Uh, you know, I was active. I was, you know, hiking mountains, doing everything that I could in the, the outdoor mountain lifestyle kind of area that I could possibly get my hands on and I wanted that back again. So that was a lot of my focus coming out of the rehab hospital. How do I get back to the White Mountains? Um, I went home and was living with my parents in Connecticut, came back up here um, as soon as I could, and I started skiing 10 months after. And you know, the, and, that was, and it was hard. It was, it was a little different than I thought it was gonna be, but I stuck with it and it quickly became, you know, the most amazing thing I could have ever encountered. I think one of the, the unique um, relationships that we have at New England Disabled Sports is that with our own mountain, Loon Mountain here, has been a, a relationship you know, from the beginning that's been very powerful and, uh, and very, I guess, embracing of each other. Um, the fact that we wear the same ski school jacket as our regular Alpine Ski and Ride School is kind of unprecedented, I think, in the industry. The fact that you know, we have an, that much of an even respect for each other is has worked out really well. We're very fortunate to have a program here at Loon that offers expertise that it does um, to disabled skiers and riders. It's a great program. We work very well together. We work very closely together and we kind of play off of one another and help promote each, you know, the New England Disabled Sports helps promote Loon and we help promote the program as well. And, you know, it's great just to have that variety here to offer something else to Loon Mountain and on top of everything else that we offer for families. We train together on, on at different times. We are open to each other coming to our own, each other's clinics, which is, is kind of neat to be able to have that. And they love having us as part of it. I've gone over to their ski school and taught clinics. Um, and a lot of our guys go over and participate to become, you know, better Alpine teachers. You know, we do a lot of those in-house as well. But the fact that we have this sort of reciprocal you can come in and come out is great. And it also really helps on a lot of levels with inclusion. You know, if they run into a student that's in one of their classes that has some type of a, a disability, and a lot of times it, it ends up being in the, you know, emotional or cognitive realm where, they're, where we're talking about, um, we're able to help them out by sending a coach who's in the same, who has the skill level to be able to deal with their, those situations, um, who is wearing the same coat and that child doesn't have to feel like they're somewhere special. It's just a regular ski school. Same instructor, same jacket, nothing different. Just there to help maybe um, redirect the person, keep them on task. And, and that relationship has been very positive for them because they don't have to have a coach. Ours are volunteers. They have paid coaches um, and they could never afford to have two or three coaches maybe with a group where they have children with disabilities or, or adults. 
um, in that group. It's just not cost effective to their to the business model, and we're able to help smooth that over and make it really cost effective for them. So there is a whole business part to it that really helps them as well. Again, it's that transparency, you know, it doesn't matter who, we just teach people how to ski, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what their ability or disability is. Um, here at Loon, um, the, the NEDS program, they have the same same jacket as, as the ski school does. Um, and the, the beauty of that too is um, the people that work for NEDS, they're on a, on a, um, a um, volunteer basis, but if we need them um, during busy periods to, to help uh, teach skiing um, in, in the regular ski school, we can do that too. We can just put them on a payroll and people that have worked for us in the past, they kind of float back and forth. So it's a really nice, nice uh, partnership that we've developed. And you know, when we need help the, or they need help, it's, it's back and forth. They're our greatest sponsor. They give us passes for our, our, um, our coaches, for all our volunteers. And they provide you know, our, our lift tickets and our rentals at a discounted rate as well so that we can make this happen and make it affordable for disabled families to come out. They also re have um, bought into the fact that for every disabled child or adult that comes here, they usually bring three or four family members that are buying tickets, buying into programming, buying food, all of those pieces. And that's how the business model works and that's why it's worth having an adaptive ski school at a mountain. That's what it does, skiing saves people. When I first um, heard about Cam Shaw Duran, um, it was an introduction through his grandmother, mother, a variety of people, local people um, calling me um, and saying, this kid's had a really bad injury, he's paralyzed, he's, he's just like you, can you come talk to him? And, and my first response is, I can't just come and start coming down on him saying, you gotta get your life together, you gotta pull it together, man, you know, and, and this is what I'm doing. So I said, what, what we need to do is we sort of arranged, uh, I mean, where he saw me doing something. Um, at the time I was coaching soccer for a local high school and he was, I think he kind of saw that I was doing something normal. And that was the start of it. Next thing I, I was um, doing a lot of downhill mountain biking too. I just sort of arranged it and that uh, popped by his place and he and Bodie Miller were their roommates and they were at that time too. Swung by, had the, the downhill mountain bike in the back of the car and just happened to see him on the side of the road and pulled it out and we all ripped around, you know, just Bodie was shoving him up and down hills and dropping him over this and that and he was like, wow, this is pretty cool. So I got him to come out and try that Try that a couple of times, and we talked, got into skiing. Jeff came to me and said, you know, I, I know you can't walk, but I don't really care about that. You can still ski, so let's, let's get out here on the hill and you know, I'll show what you can do. It really, um, really enticed him. And it's, I'd say it's the, one of the things that truly saved him and gave him a, a focus again in his life, that ability that, wow, I can ski and I can still live my life the way I, I loved it. I could be a ski bum if I want to. So I came out and I beat myself up on the hill quite a bit, but I ended up uh, falling in love with it right away. And uh, now I, I can't get enough of it. I'm here all the time with Jeff and, you know, he ended up my best friend and we do everything now. Biking, you know, skiing, uh, water skiing, all, all of it, you know, so it's just nice to have 
um, an outlet of sports and just realizing what you, you can do with your life, even if you are disabled. Um, and now I have the opportunity to give back what Jeff gave to me to other people. So when I teach someone how to drop their hip into a turn or how to get out there on the hill, uh, whether it's a 10 year old named Owen, one of my favorite students, or a 30 year old guy, you know, going for his medical degree that just wants to learn how to ski, it's, it's an incredible feeling to, to give something back like that to them. He realized there was more than just being a ski bum out of this or just being a skier. He realized that he could uh, become a businessman again. He started working for um, beverage companies um, and became a salesman for and a rep for those. Got really heavily involved in that and now he's um, moved on is doing some product development with uh, Bodie's Foundation, Turtle Ridge Foundation, um, trying to develop adaptive equipment to make it a little less expensive for the average um, end user out there and developing high-end stuff. Stuff that's specifically designed, say, for skiers. It could be, you know, the next generation of skis that actually is, are built for, say, mono skis in particular. So, pretty neat um, focus that's developed out of that relationship and, I mean, I, I couldn't be more proud of what he's become because of that. And it, and it really just started with making a few turns on the hill. I'm on top of the world now. I feel great, physically and mentally. I feel absolutely great. Are you ready to panic? It's that time of year. My name is Pete Jeffers, and uh, today was my fourth full day of skiing. I'd never skied before in my life. Um, I came up here about three weeks ago with a program through the Veterans Administration. And uh, I had so much fun. I, I just thought about it and thought about it ever since we were up here three weeks ago and, and I had to come back up and try it some more. And I, I found something that I really, really love doing now. It's, I can't get it out of my head. Well, one of the things that's amazing is that you, know, that you can have a guy who's, who's been disabled for a long, long time and really hasn't you know, gotten off the couch or hasn't been out in the world experiencing some of the things that are really out there that he could take advantage of. Well, I lost my legs because of the Vietnam War. Um, The government has deemed me 100% disabled, uh, which, which is a good thing to have. It's, uh, there's a lot of things to be grateful for. Uh, they give me a chair, they give me the opportunity to go skiing. Um, they've given me a lot, uh, but it took a lot of years, a lot of years, uh, to get to where I even wanted any part of it. And it amazes me that, you know, you can have somebody that's been, had a disability for that long of a time, and here it is, you know, 20, 30 years later, and he's just getting out and experiencing something that's changed his life. Um, and I think for me, that's, that's the most precious gift I'm able to give to people is that, because it's not just going to be skiing for him. It, it, it isn't. It's going to be a variety of things. He's getting a whole different confidence level just because of being outdoors and finding a, a different focus. Um, th that is the coolest part of my job, is just giving somebody a, a new focus, a, a new, um, new excitement in their lives, and that feeling that pretty much anything is possible. It's definitely an adrenaline rush. And it, I guess it has its moments when it's a little bit scary, but it's more fun than it is scary. So kind of in the day comes along here, and um, I usually like to go check out and see how the guys' lessons went, you know. You know, what kind of problems maybe they encountered, you know. Just customer service stuff, basically really good. 
things to check out how they felt, you know, things that they felt they worked on or accomplished or were able to do out there during the day. It makes them feel good, you know, to have somebody come up and especially from the chair perspective too, works really well that they get that kind of one-on-one, maybe if they're at eye level. They want to talk to me about their day too and just see what's the next level or and it's not just skiing that we talk about, we talk about things like what wheelchair should I buy, you know, like what kind of car, what kind of adaptations are you doing around your house. I mean, it, it's a lot more than just teaching skiing around here. It's a lot about being a life coach, kind of just different things. You know, some of the young guys were talking about dating and different things that you encountered in that sort of world, you know. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, um, it's fun for me to give back some of my knowledge and my experiences that I've had around the world and just around the country that I've gained from just even traveling through PSIA and ASI. sometimes. Next time you drive. Next time signal your turn. That's why we got a Subaru. Love wherever the road takes you. Get to the next level and enjoy all the mountains has to offer when you go with a pro. Fun and freedom are yours for the taking with expert coaching from a certified ski or snowboard instructor. Next time you head to your favorite resort, check out the local ski and snowboard school. Or visit www.thesnowpros.org to find out more about what great ski and snowboard instructors can do for you. No matter where you go or how you choose to ride the mountain, remember, go with a pro. Do you see it? There it is. There. Where? It's getting away. Where is it? It's gone. We'll find it. Any day can be an adventure. That's why we got a Subaru. Love wherever the road takes you. I own a concession ski school and run a race program up at Stevens Pass, which is about 70, 80 miles from downtown Seattle, uh, up in the Cascades. My parents started it uh, in about 1966, when I was about three years old. My mom was, uh, was an ex-racer from Canada, um, was one of the first women examiners in Canada, one of the first women certified instructors in Canada. Um, she met my dad, moved down here, and they taught skiing, and they were asked to start a ski school. It was a great, great upbringing. Um, as I got older, I, my passion was racing. I raced, went through um, all the different levels of, of racing here, and then um, kept progressing, moved to Idaho, um, made it up to the U.S. ski team, skied on the U.S. ski team for a couple years. Um, went to college, raced at the college level. Um, then met my wife, got married. <clears throat> we started a, a life and then um, my mom said, if I want the ski school, it's time to come back. So I came back and took over the ski school from her. We basically pack up the trailer and move up to the ski area, park our trailer at the ski area for the four days or five days, however long it is, and base out of that trailer up at the ski area. So we kind of have a, a house on wheels, if you will. 
Our typical work week starts on Wednesday. We get everything packed up and we move up to Stevens for the weekend. And then we teach lessons Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We have about 550 kids in ski school right now. We have a staff of about 70 instructors. So it's actually a pretty decent sized program. And all of our business is done in seven weeks. So it's very intensive at the same time. We teach mostly four hour all day lessons. We start with kids that are age two and a half all the way through adult and through racing actually and instructor training as well. Um, we have programs where we take kids up on buses uh, where we work with school districts, pick them up at school and bring them up for weekend lessons. And we have big programs where families drive up on their own to learn to ski or snowboard. It's, it's very important to us that we put out a, a quality product and also that we um, have very personal relationships with the athletes and students that, that we have. So our program is relatively small and in the race world in particular, it's, it's quite small. And that enables us to have long-term relationships with the kids who come through the program. I guess from the outside, it looks like a lot of hard work. It looks like many hours and heavy labor. Today, we had a tough day on the mountain. We had uh, five inches of new snow and, and it hadn't been groomed and we're in the Pacific Northwest, so our snow can be heavy at times. And it took a lot of work to be able to have the opportunity to train for the kids who needed to train. It took hours to get it all set up and, and to tear it down, but we don't really notice that because that's what we need to do because that's what the kids need. And whatever the kids need, that's what we make happen. We also run a race program. That's where my, um, my passions were as I was growing up. Uh, I love racing and, and performance. And what, in a lot of respects, what racing is, is just fine tuning free skiing. Um, it's one of the things I talk to the kids a ton about is, is it's not just racing, it's ski racing, and the first word in ski racing is ski. And you have to be able to ski, you have to be able to make good turns. Um, that's the only way you're gonna be fast. And so in, in the idea that we try to foster to them is that it's all about skiing and the turn you're making, and then it's how do we make it faster through the process. Um, how can we be more efficient, how can we be uh, cleaner in what we're trying to do? How can we be more disciplined in, in our movements in our body to, to achieve what we're trying to achieve? Um, at the same time, trying to make it and help them with the fact that when they're done with their racing career, they still love to ski. Um, that's my number one objective with the kids is that when they're done, they're going out and going skiing. They're in college, they're teaching other people how to ski or they're, they're finding a reason to go skiing because that's what they love to do. And that's my number one thing. Now that I have some boys of my own, it's, it's been really fun to go back through the process that I kind of went through uh, being part of the ski school um, having my parents do it, it, it's been really fun sharing with them uh, the, the experiences of, of teaching skiing, of being around it, of understanding a, a sport pretty in-depthly. Growing up in a ski school and being around uh, and skiing all your life, it's a, little, it's a little bit different, you know? When you come home and you're not skiing on a weekend, you're like, what do people do for a living? Because, you know, you're used to up skiing and and it kind of becomes just ingrained. You just go out, you ski, you have fun, that's what you like doing. It it definitely changes your perspective on what you do, for sure. Growing up through the ski school was it was unbelievable. It was a really cool experience. It's, it's one huge family. I, I'm really close with all the instructors and I think it helped a lot for my skiing. Transitioning into racing, it, it got better because now I have a, a really good group that supports me. Uh, I, yeah, I can go up to any one of them and say, you know, this is what I'm struggling with. What are your ideas? Can you help me with it? Because our family is so committed to skiing and ski instruction and ski racing, it's, it's pretty invasive. It, it takes over our lives easily. Um, for myself, as the mom, I get to manage and herd the cats and do the laundry and, and help do all of that. And it and it's, can be pretty difficult to, to manage it all. 
but the lessons that the kids learn through the process make it all worthwhile. I don't think that there's a lot of places still for children where they can have the kind of freedom and autonomy that they have on the mountain. One of the big reasons I do it is, is because of the lifestyle it affords us as a family. Um, you know, nobody teaches skiing to get rich, but um, we're very rich in lifestyle. Um, we get to spend, as a family, we get to spend a ton of time together um, sharing um, joys that, that we all love to do. Um, we get to play a lot together in, in things that are fun. Um, it allows us to do things that, that together as a family that, that a lot of families don't get to do nowadays. Uh, my kids can have a conversation with any adult on the chair. They've had to do that since they were five or six years old, right? Um, they've traveled to Europe. They've traveled to South America by themselves at 16, 17 years old. So um, it's a family affair that makes this work. They can pack their stuff, they can do their laundry. Everybody has little roles. It's not always easy. Sometimes it's bumpy, people get cranky, and we just um, try to be gracious with each other and understand. My oldest right now is getting ready to go to an important race for him, and we've been giving him a hard time the last couple days because he's had his cranky pants on. Um, but it's, it's part of the process, and, and we believe it's a great way for them to grow up and um, they're turning into to adults that we respect and that's what's most important to us. Having been brought up in that lifestyle, um, it, it's a fantastic way to understand um, different people's perspectives and, and it really rounds out um, your understandings and beliefs um, by, by being able to to have a lot of time together doing something that you enjoy doing, that you love to do, um, with other people that love to do it.